Mr. Stuart Weed. Thank you for coming on the show today, my friend. How's it going? Good, thanks, Shane. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here, man. You're a, a very interesting person. You're a clinical <laughs> hypnotherapist, <laughs> a sports performance mind coach, a personal trainer, a world champion athlete. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's quite a resume to say the least. But, you know, today we're here to talk about how this, all this stuff works, right? And, and how you've managed to bridge the gap between, you know, the hypnotherapy side of things with the training and the connection between, you know, your mind and your body and how that affects everything you do. And that's both in athletics or in your personal life or in a business capacity. I mean, fundamentally, you know, the technique applies to, to pretty much everything, right? It's about how you can become and be the sort of best version of yourself to achieve whatever greatness that you're out to, to go for, right? So Absolutely. it's going to be fun. So how about uh, yeah. just to, to get going, how did you work your way into the clinical hypnotherapy side from being in the athletics field? Sure, sure. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my, my story, really. Um, I'll, I'll try not to be all day with it, but it, it informs how I got into the, the clinical hypnotherapy work. So I've been training and competing in martial arts since I was six years old. And I started out in Taekwondo. And then as I got older, it moved into kickboxing and a little bit of boxing and Muay Thai. And I'm a huge MMA fan, but I haven't done much grappling myself. Um, I have friends that have, but, uh, but yeah, so I've always been training and competing. And then when I was in my probably mid teens, I somewhere along the way picked up a visualization routine. Hmm. And I don't know where I got that from, but I started implementing it in my practice and in competition. And so I, in, a, in a tournament, I would do my physical warm up. I would go somewhere quiet, out of the way, and I would either sit down or kneel down, close my eyes, and I would visualize in my mind what I wanted to do out there in the tournament. And it seemed to work really well for me. At the time, I didn't understand it. I didn't know why. I just knew that it worked. So I kept yeah. doing it. Then I did a degree in applied sport and exercise science at university. And it, within that, we had sports psychology as a module. Mm -hmm. And so that built on my knowledge of sports psychology and how to utilize the mind and direct it for a sporting performance a little bit more. It wasn't as in-depth as a full uh, standalone sports psycholo psychology qualification, but it was a no. good foundation. And so after that, after the degree, I, I got qualified as a personal trainer and I began working self-employed as a personal trainer pretty much straight out of university. All the while, I was still competing and training in Taekwondo and kickboxing. I went through a little period where my mentality and competition was being affected in terms of my fitness. I had a couple of tournaments where I fatigued quite badly, and I ended up losing because of fatigue, not because of any, any skill discrepancy, um, it was the fatigue that I just couldn't perform. And I, I'm under no illusions that my training could have been better. My nutrition could have been better, but it was affecting me psychologically. I would be going into a tournament then thinking, oh my God, is it going to happen again? Am I going to mm -hmm. gas again? And so I sought out hypnotherapy as a means to overcome that mental issue. And having that as a client, I found it fascinating. It was, it was amazing how well it worked. And so that piqued my curiosity a little bit more. And then, but I didn't do anything with it at that point. A little bit further down the road, maybe a year or two later, I had some personal stuff going on. I wasn't in the best headspace. And some of those issues in terms of my confidence in my fitness had just started to creep back in a little bit. And at the time, this was the beginning of 2013, um, there's a, a famous hypnotist from London here in England called Paul McKenna, 
who you may or may not have heard of over there. Um, <clears throat> but he, he's done a lot of work all over the world. He, he's quite famous as a, as a hypnotist and a hypnotherapist. And he was releasing his latest book at that time on a new technique called havening, which mm-hmm. he helped to develop. And there was a two-page um, article in one of the, the main tabloid newspapers here in the UK all about this havening technique and this new book that Paul was releasing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there was a little column down the right-hand side of the, uh, of the article there with a competition. Yeah. And there were going to be three people selected in the UK to go to Paul's house in the centre of London and have him do the havening technique with you in person to help you overcome whatever issues were afflicting you. And so because I wasn't in a great headspace at the time, I thought, what the hell, I- I'm going to enter. And so yeah. I did, and I was lucky enough to be picked. And so I cool. came down to London, met Paul. He and I got along incredibly well because we we both uh, huge admirers of Bruce Lee. Um, Bruce Lee was, is yeah. both of our idols. And so we, we immediately had that to talk about. Uh, but yeah, we did the technique. It was amazing. It, it, it worked tremendously well. And Paul explained about the science behind it and a little bit of how it works as well and why it works. Mm-hmm. And while I was there, I asked him, I said, I want to get qualified in this industry. I want to be able to help other people with it and also continue to help myself and, you know, to overcome mm-hmm. any issues that I might face in future personally, as well as help other people overcome theirs. So he said, you should study the NLP practitioner course, that's Neuro Linguistic Programming, with Dr. Richard Bandler. He's one of the co-founders mm-hmm. of NLP and he was Paul's mentor. He taught him everything he knows by Paul's admission. And so I did. I booked on the earliest NLP practitioner course with Dr. Bandler that I could, got qualified there, and then almost immediately after, through the wonders of Google, I started seeing advertisements for clinical hypnotherapy qualifications. <laughs> and yeah. who knew? <laughs> and um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I then saw one that was in my hometown in the north of England where I was living at the time. And there was a taster weekend for it. So I booked on the free taster weekend. And then after experiencing that, I booked on the full qualification. And then 10 months later, I was fully qualified as a clinical hypnotherapist as well. And I've been working with clients ever since. And it's been just over seven years now. Wow. That's quite a story. I mean, I have a bunch of questions for you, if you don't mind. I mean, so just to take it a step back, at that time when you were feeling very fatigued, right, and it was affecting your competition, what made you go for a mental uh, approach to it? What Was it that the anxiety of, or I don't know if anxiety is the right word, but was it how the fatigue was mentally affect, affecting things and the anxiety of it happening again? Was that being a problem or, you know, how did, because that by itself, like, how does that resolve the fatigue or was the fatigue really a mental fatigue more than anything else? Sure. I think, yeah, the anxiety of it happening, happening again was, was a factor for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I like to think that I'm quite self-aware and, and always sort of have been really, um, quite introspective and I kind of caught myself with negative self-talk, you know, Mm. I caught myself kind of talking myself into that negative state. Oh, it's going to happen again. And, you know, almost setting myself up for failure essentially. And that wasn't, that wasn't a physical issue. That was me. I was, I was reaffirming that to myself. And so that, that told me that it was something mentally that I need to address. Yes. I need to address the training and nutrition aspect, but if I'm telling myself the wrong words, I'm, I'm setting myself up for failure, essentially. Right. And subsequently, then I probably wouldn't do the physical things that I would need to, to reinforce that. So, um, and, and it probably came from the sports psychology study as well in my degree, 
you know, having learned about different yeah. psychological theories and how they apply to sport, I was probably, I don't, I, I didn't necessarily equate this at the time, but with hindsight, I was probably thinking about those theories and then thinking, well, maybe that's what I'm experiencing now. And so that's yeah. what, what I should address perhaps. And so, yeah, I, I think, I, I think that was probably how it played out. Yeah. And that's huge, right? And that self-awareness is a crucial part of it because, you know, many, many of us aren't that self-aware and, and we're just kind of going about and trying to solve the things as they kind of pop up, you know, in our lives. And so if you have a seemingly physical fatigue problem, you're like, oh, well, that's the problem. I need to fix that. And then you're not aware of how the mental and the psychological aspects contribute to it and how it affects it directly like not even indirectly it's you know if you take the time to just introspect a little bit you'll notice that your thoughts do create your reality to a very large degree right and so Absolutely. if you're telling yourself if you're telling yourself all this crazy nonsense and all this bullshit about how i suck and this sucks and all that kind of negative self-talk it's like yeah i mean well what's going to happen is that's just how you're going to see things right and then you're going to believe it into existence almost and, um, Absolutely, you know, create that reality. So, yeah, so kudos to you too for being that aware. I mean, I don't know if it's really a, a credit that you can like feel like is an accomplishment, but it, it's, you know, admirable nonetheless. Um, oh, thank you. But so, yeah, but so, you know, it, it's a really interesting area to explore, which is the psychology of sport and of athletics and of physical training. And it's an increasingly popular field, right? Like 50 years ago, the athletes that were being trained in whatever it is, it's like it was a physical training for the most part. Now, they might tell you that there's a huge mental component to it, but they weren't necessarily being trained mentally, right? Or they were, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm wrong on this, but maybe you can um, explain a little bit more. But it's like maybe, I mean, you know that there's a huge mental aspect to performance in general. But, you know, there's a very much focus on like the physical skills and the nutrition and setting your body up for success in that capacity. And then more recently has it come to light that like, well, your mind needs to be at just as high of a level, if not more so to be able to deal with it and to succeed or to be a champion in that capacity, right? So have you noticed that it's like an increasing field, like whether it's hypnotherapy or it's just regular therapy or NLP or, you know, affirmations or meditation? It's like there seems to be this whole movement towards increasing the psychological aspect into sports and athletics in general. Absolutely. Yeah, it's... It is, as you say, it's very much a, a growing field. And <clears throat> I think it's, it used to be very taboo. You know, it mm. was, it was a subject that you don't really talk about, whether it, you can talk in sports or in just in life in general, if someone was struggling with something mental, whether it was clinical depression or anxiety or a fear or a phobia, you, you name it. Um, it wasn't something sort of society would encourage you to talk about and seek help about. It was, you know, very much kind of grit your teeth and get on with it, you know? Yeah. And Pull your particularly in, up. yeah, yeah, exactly. Over here in, in Britain, it's always been the whole British stiff upper lip thing, you know, where yeah. you just, you just soldier on regardless and and that's fine for a while but sooner or later something's got to give and certainly in the last couple of years and in recent years in general more and more public figures and athletes are coming out and speaking about mental health issues whether they've experienced anxiety or depression during their careers and that's that's very much made the subject much more mainstream and for you know joe public then might be watching 
some famous person on TV talking about their struggles and they've been experiencing something too. And that might encourage them to go and seek help where before they may have felt very mm -hmm. self-conscious and not able to go and speak out. I mean, look at the last two days in the Olympics, Simone Biles talking about yeah. her, her struggles with mental health in this Olympics right now. And she just doesn't feel mentally ready to go out there and perform. You know, a few years ago, she, well, she may have come out in public and spoken about it, but certainly in years gone by, that would not have been put up in the public forum. It would have been, oh, she's got an injury yeah. or, or something like that, you know, where now it is much Nervous more... Nervous breakdown. <laughs> yeah, it's much more common now, much more commonplace to actually voice these things and, and go and seek help, which is a good thing. Um, it is a very good thing because mental health problems are, you know, it can get anybody. It's not... It's not specific to any gender, race, age, you know, and anybody can be afflicted with something. And so it is good that it's growing now in terms of acceptance and the recognition that, okay, I'm going through this, I should seek help, whatever that may be, hypnotherapy, counseling, psychotherapy, you name it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's so huge that it's becoming more accepted these days. And, you know, I think that, people who have been through something like, you know, some kind of mental challenge. I mean, you know, diagnostically, whatever, but it's what, once you've been through it and you come out on the other side or you figure out how to live with it or how to deal with it, that can open up that window of compassion to be able to be like, yeah, like ev or most people suffer through something and it sucks and it's fine in the sense of like, they're not, crazy or deluded or you know whatever kind of fancy words that people use it's like no that's just what it means to be human just like you can get a physical injury you can get a mental injury and you know you need it it 100%. needs treatment and it needs therapy like a therapeutic approaches to it and it's it's great that it's you know i mean it sucks that so many people suffer obviously but it's good that um we're at a place now where I mean, you can talk, I guess it depends what circles you run in, but for the most part, you know, if you say to someone like, oh, I was in therapy or my therapist said this, you know, like back in the day, people would look at you like you've just said, you know, some crazy shit that you were like, why are you talking about this? But now they're like, oh yeah, my therapist says the same thing or like, oh, I did it once or I did that or I did CBT or you know, and people try various things and it's good. And, and it's amazing that this has really gotten to a place where it can be spoken about so openly. And listen, I mean, with like Simone, you know, sure, there's a, a lot of, you know, negative comments about it. And you still have lots of people who are saying, you know, that it's weakness or that it's, you know, all kinds of bullshit. But, it, you know, that's just them projecting their own shit onto her and, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it it does suck for her. Like, I wouldn't like to be on the other end of receiving all those messages. Um, but I'm sure she received at least an equal, if not a greater number of supportive messages from athletes or from people in general being like, as you say, you know, you, you're coming out and talking about this or, you know, really like giving up this so-called giving up this opportunity that you've trained for your life for because of this like mental health issue like that's huge, right? And it's not the do all and be all. Like, I mean, she has a whole life ahead of her. And so w there's no point of her ruining it for, I mean, whatever, right? Like she's got her own shit to deal with. And I'm sure, well, hopefully she's being helped and supported properly, but um, it is, it's such a huge thing. And so, you know, in your world of like the personal training hypnotherapy combo world, um, how do you like incorporate it into your daily interactions with people is it like when you're working with a client let's say in a personal training capacity do you incorporate um, a lot of these techniques that you've learned so you know it's not necessarily a formal hypnotherapy session but like a lot of it in terms of like how you talk to yourself and the messages you're saying and you know how you think about things like does that come out in these personal training sessions as well yeah it does and that's one of the big things 
since studying and getting qualified in the NLP and in hypnotherapy, it's changed my understanding of how to communicate with my clients. Mm. And in terms of coaching them, you know, it's given me the tools to be able to coach them better, to be able to elicit their values and what their deep reasons are for doing this, you know, mm. because anybody can say, oh, I, I want to lose weight. Okay. Why do you want to lose weight? Because I want to look good in my swimsuit on holiday this summer. Okay, great. So why do you want to look good in your, in your swimsuit this summer? You know, and so you dig down a little bit yeah. and then you'll get to that big emotive reason that's their why. And once you've got that and once they've admitted that to themselves as well, and sometimes they might not even know, you know, it could be a completely subconscious program that's running in the background that they're not even consciously aware of. But yeah. once you've brought that to the surface, depending what it is, admittedly, and that's why I wouldn't say to anybody not trained to just, you know, go and dig out somebody's deepest, darkest secrets. But yeah. once you've, once you've discovered that information and once they as the client have discovered that, that's adding fuel to the fire then to keep them going with their training. And the mind and the body are inextricably linked. You cannot do one thing without the other. And that was one thing that I noticed mm -hmm. quite early on, even before I got qualified in, in NLP and hypnotherapy. I could be training a client in personal training and I could be telling them what exercises to do, what foods to be eating, you know, ha, um, what their sleeping pattern should be like, advising on any supplements that they might want to take. And I could tell them all this until I was blue in the face, but if they weren't mentally engaged with it for whatever reason, that's right. a massive hurdle to overcome because then you know, the 23 hours a day that they weren't with me, what are they doing? Are they then going to just go back to eating the junk food or sitting on the backside on the couch all day or, you know, going to bed in the early hours of the, mor of the morning and then getting up at 6 a.m. having had, you know, a couple of hours sleep. It's, it's, it affects everything. And if they're mm -hmm. mentally on board with the process they're going to get their results so much faster. And the few, the clients that I've done formal hypnotherapy with over the years, in addition to personal training, their results mm -hmm. have just been astronomical, you know, and yeah. quicker and more effective than I, than even I thought possible. And, um, it, it's amazing to be able to help on aspects of that. Yeah, because I, I guess, you know, you wouldn't normally associate all of those things together, right? Like you wouldn't as a normal, I mean, a sort of just a regular person, you know, you wouldn't be like, Oh, okay, well I want to go and I want to build some muscle and get jacked or be fit, or I want to run this race or I want to do something. You're like, so I'm going to go see a personal trainer. You don't, th your mind doesn't automatically go to, okay, maybe I should also go see some sort of therapist about it, you know? Yeah. And, it, we just we don't have that intuitive connection necessarily and so it's really awesome that there's people like you who are out there being like hey well okay we'll deal with your physical the physical so-called aspect of it right and here's the training and this is what we need to do and this is your nutrition and getting that side of things worked out but knowing that like well this is only at most half of it right like if you're not mentally bought into it and, you know, I think this is like the power of why I think who was that? Um, Simon Sinek was Simon did he Sinek. write that book. Yep. I think. Yeah. yeah. So that's what it is. It's like, until you're ready to buy in, like it's going to be a serious uphill battle of you against yourself. Right. Where one part of you is fighting a different part of you for competing reasons. And you, to be aware of it helps because then at least you know what's going on, right? But to be unaware of it, it's torturous and you just end up bailing on either some of it or all of it like fairly quickly, right? 
And I mean, it, it does come down to, to at least in part, in my opinion, to that, that mental capacity, like how motivated you are towards achieving whatever it is that you're setting out to achieve. But so how often do people come in thinking that let's come to, to train with you or counsel with you or something, <laughs> a client, uh, let's say, um, how often do clients come in and say, okay, I want to lose weight or I want to do this or that. And then, you know, over time you start with the questions and the, you know, communication and however it is that your approach is. And then they realize they're like, oh, well, I mean, that the, I, the losing weight thing is actually just a relatively insignificant part of just trying to heal myself, right? Mm -hmm. Does that happen? Like, do people change their whole goal setting strategy or whatever? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's, um, as you say, it, it doesn't happen straight away. You know, we'll, we'll embark on, on a course of personal training and we'll look at the nutrition and things like that. And the more, the more that rapport builds between myself and the client, the more they feel comfortable to open up then and, and talk about those deeper reasons. I mean, I try, I would try and get, get to those underlying reasons initially anyway. Sometimes people hold things back, you know, and, yeah, and they have, everybody has their own reasons for that. And, you know, it is what it is, but, but yes, it does happen like that where the, there's that realization somewhere along the way that hmm, maybe there's something deeper at play here as to why I want to lose this weight, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, being overweight is not healthy. So there's, there's not yeah. necessarily a deep and meaningful reason behind it and all this, and that you should just accept yourself the way you are and all that kind of stuff in terms of the weight that you are. Um, although I do agree with the whole self-acceptance thing. I also think that that can sometimes give people an out to just mm. sit back and relax and like, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all I need to be. And it is what it is. Yes. And no, you know, if you're, if yeah. you're overweight, you should do something about that, you know, be yeah. happy in yourself, but then see what you can achieve. Then see if you yeah. can be better, you know, be the best version of yourself and everybody's different. You know, we each have our own path and, uh, yeah, we're all on this journey together, but in, in different ways and scenarios. And so, uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's working with the individual and finding out what it is that makes them tick and helping them get to where they want to be. Yeah, definitely. Because, yeah, of course, right, like the health aspect of weight loss or, you know, muscle building or anything like that, like there's obviously a huge component in science and literature of that. And it's like, I, I completely agree. It's like, yes, you should love yourself as a person, right? And you should accept yourself the way that you are in the sense of right now you accept the way that you are because I mean, how much control did you really have getting to this point? Like don't be mm -hmm. too hard on yourself or whatever it is and things happen Absolutely. and we're biologically set up for different things. And yeah. And you know, the sort of, you know, no one should be mean to you about anything, obviously, right? Like people should treat you like a normal person, regardless of how you look. And I think that's the intention of the, you know, these kinds of like modern movements of like the, the various acceptance movements and that's all good stuff. Right. But Absolutely. it's, there's also the side of it, which is like, yeah, but scientifically speaking, if you're this much overweight, that's going to have a serious effect on the health of your body and your mind. Right. And mm -hmm. you don't even really need to know the science to know that, like you just feel healthier at different weight levels, right? For people who, mm. uh, you know, I've sort of known many people who have struggled with weight issues and whenever they're, you know, on the healthier side of things, whatever that looks like for them, it's like everything feels better. And it's not just because they think they look better. I mean, that's one aspect of it, but it's also because your body just functions better and mm -hmm. you're not overloading your system and putting all this enormous strain on all these various parts of your body. And, I mean, listen, it, it's a huge, it's a tremendous struggle for a lot of people, right? I mean, food yeah. addiction, um, 
it's i'm not it's not like we're just saying oh you just change your mind right just fix yourself <laughs> it's like no yeah. there's a lot that goes into it um of course but it is an interesting you know exp- like idea to run through with people and so um what's also interesting is how like in my experience being a client of personal training you know i've had some like wonderful trainers over the years and it's like it's it's kind of like a therapy session it's just mm. more like a psychotherapy session which i've also done because it's like it's you're you're just you're getting someone there to support you in the improvement of yourself in particular areas right and Sorry. depending depending on who the trainer is will depend on how it goes what kind of connection you feel with them how far they can push you because you know if you're not bought into the trainer that you're with and they try and push you, you're going to be like, mm, go fuck yourself. You know, you'll be like, I don't do that shit. Like, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, but then that's right. if you get a good one, if you get a good one and she's like, yeah, do he's like, do this and this, you're like, all right. And you're tired and whatever, but you're like, I trust you. And so I'm going to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the same thing actually in like psychotherapy set- setting where the therapist will like tell you all these things. And if you don't like them for whatever reason, um, you'll be like, no, your opinion's dumb or something. You know, you'll make up some reason in your head <laughs> to yeah, not do completely. it. Completely. But if you completely. But if you do like them and you trust them and you have that connection, then you're prepared to take on their criticism or their advice at a deeper level because I don't know, like there is that 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 connection there. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, you're, yeah you're I mean that, that was just a yeah. So on a sort of different not different note, but I'd like to get into some of the science of the hypnotherapy and the NLP. Um, at least just from a, it doesn't, doesn't have to be too technical, but just from a perspective of like, how does it work? What are the aims? You know, what systems do we work through? Like, could you talk us through that a little bit? Hmm, absolutely. So we are talking right now. We're wide awake, hopefully. And yeah. our, our brains are in a beta brainwave state, which is the conscious waking brainwave state. We're able to think critically. We might have thoughts popping in and out of our heads all the time, even in the middle of a conversation. So something might pop into your head and then pop back out. It, it is what it is. It's what happens throughout the day. And some of the estimates for how many thoughts we have in a day, is, it's absolute, in, it's insane. You know, some some yeah. schools of thought think we have between like 70,000 and 90,000 thoughts a day, every single day. And uh, that's just absolutely crazy. Um, yeah. You know, to, to just, how do you, how do you even quantify that, you know? Um, but yeah, so that's the waking state. In hypnotherapy, I'm talking to the subconscious mind. This is the part of your mind that's behind the curtain, that's running the show. Mm. We don't have to think about breathing. We don't have to think about our heart pumping. We don't have to think about our metabolism functioning. You name any, any biological function that is outside of our conscious control, you know, that's the subconscious mind that's in control of all that. And, and also, yeah, yeah, and also the programs that are running in our heads as well. The things that we tell ourselves is it's controlled by the subconscious mind and the subconscious Mm -hmm. mind takes up again, depending on different estimates, 90 to 95% of the mind, the little five Mm -hmm. to 10% is the conscious mind that we're engaging with right now in hypnotherapy. In order to access someone's subconscious mind, we need to have, have rapport, to have a good level of trust, to allow that person, the client to relax and to go with the process. And as they begin to relax, their brain waves begin to slow from that beta state, getting into an alpha state, which is the beginning phases of hypnosis. If you've ever caught yourself or you see someone else kind of staring into space or daydreaming, that's an alpha brainwave state being exhibited right there. You're aware Mm -hmm. of your surroundings in that state. You're aware of what's going on, but it doesn't affect you. You're able to, to relax and just 
be in the moment and not be distracted by external things. That's the beginning stages of hypnosis. And also, as you relax there, your heart rate slows down, your breathing rate slows down, your blood pressure begins to reduce a little bit. The sympathetic nervous system, which is the whole fight, flight, freeze, um, the, the action nervous system, essentially, starts to slow its activation down. And then the parasympathetic nervous system, which is sometimes colloquially known as the rest and digest system, that starts to increase its activation as you start to relax. Now, mm. the more the client relaxes, they'll then slow the brain waves down continually into what's called the theta state then, okay, which is it's, it's the main brainwave state that we work with in hypnotherapy. This is where the magic happens, essentially, because in that theta brainwave state, the critical thinking, the critical mind has been put to one side. The conscious mind has been put to one side, and the client is very suggestible in that state. They're very open to positive suggestion. Now, I can't make someone do something that they don't want to. That, that's not <laughs> yeah. the thing, because that... that it, there's just a disconnect there with their deep values, you know, but that's why I work with the client to find out what it is that they want. And then I will talk to them about strategies to get that in that theta state because their mind is so open to positive suggestion. And I always relay it to people when I'm explaining as uh, a metaphor like of in the gym. Okay. If you mm -hmm. went to the gym every single day and you did, you know, forget about sets and reps and tempos and all that kind of stuff. Let's just say you do a bunch of bicep curls with a reasonable weight every day for a month. Your biceps are probably going to be more toned, if not stronger. They yeah. probably will grow a little bit in size because of that repetition and that stress and the muscle has had to adapt by growing. Okay, going through a, a hypertrophy phase. Now, the same thing is true of our thought pro processes. Each thought is a little neural network in the brain, a little electrical signal going between these neurons that can be either a good thing or a bad thing. And if it's something that's holding us back, that little neural pathway in the brain isn't necessarily going to be firing as much in that theta state. And that's where I can suggest a different thought process that's hmm. going to be for the betterment of the client, that's going to be something that they want to achieve. And so where that old neural network might have been here, that might fire off some new neurons over here. And so, but with repetition... This neural pathway, the same way those biceps get stronger with repetition, this will get stronger. And because the body is always after homeostasis and it doesn't want to do anything too much out of its comfort zone for very long, it wants, it wants that balanced state. If you're not using this old neural pathway over here, it goes through a process called synaptic pruning. And it's literally mm. just snipping off that neural pathway because it's not needed anymore. Okay. Right. And so that's what we're doing in hypnosis. And there is a deeper brainwave state called the delta state, but that's, that's what we all experience when we're fast asleep in the middle of the night. We don't get, because of the sleep cycle duration, we don't get there in a typical hypnotherapy session. Mm -hmm. And so then as the client then at the end of the session comes through a bit of a re-alert process, I'll start to just encourage them to come out of that state. So the brainwaves will increase going back through the theta state, the alpha state, and into a beta state when they're able to come back to full conscious awareness, we've, we've installed the new software in the brain then. And then with repetition, with little homework exercises that I'll have them do each day, we're building on those foundations so that then each session we do, we're able to build the same way again that you would in the gym. You know, when a weight becomes comfortable, you increase to the next weight or you increase your repetitions or you change the tempos or whatever it might be. You, you, you know, change the, mm -hmm. the periodization phase that you're doing. So that's a bit of the science as to how it works. And there's more and more research going on now, which is great as to yeah. an even deeper understanding of how it works. And um, yeah, it's a fascinating time to be in the field.
Yeah, no, it's it's amazing, and I think that was a really very elegant and well put explanation. So thank you. I mean, what in, so here here's a question: Is that when a person, let's say, in the middle of a hypnotherapy session, uh, so you've gone through the relaxation process, right? So you, if I'm not mistaken, so you're dropping or you're changing your brain, your primary brainwave state from beta to alpha to theta, right? In that, does it that's go in right. that order? Yeah. Yes, that's okay. right. Yeah. Um, and so you do that through various, just like relaxation techniques, you know, coaching or guiding people, kind of like a meditation where yeah. you know you're, what? Yeah, whatever it is. And then, so in that theta state, um, how conscious are are you in that? Not you, the client. How conscious are you of what's happening? Um, you know, I mean, I, I get that you're communicating with the subconscious and you've kind of deactivated a lot of the critical thinking conscious mind. So do people like remember what you've said to them or how does that work? So everybody's different. Some people mm. do remember and some people don't. There's, there's a, a concept called hypnotic amnesia, which mm. can be um, engineered by the therapist. So, for example, if a client was in, in that theta state, in a deep trance state, I could give them suggestions that they would forget everything consciously that I've said to them in that state. So then when they come back to full conscious awareness, they, they probably wouldn't know. And there are also techniques mm. that I can do as, as they come out of that hypnotic state to engineer some hypnotic amnesia as well. But... Sometimes I don't. I don't necessarily think that it's um, necessary to do that. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. it is. If if you're dealing with something that might be a little bit traumatic or a little bit emotional mm. for the client, um, sometimes it, it's good to allow them to just forget that stuff in in that state when they're going about the rest of their day. But. As I say, everybody's different. Sometimes they can consciously just, just recall everything that was said and sometimes not. The only thing that I say to my clients is that after we finished our session, just let it, whatever, you know, whether you remember or not, just let it go to the back of your mind. Just go about the rest of your day. Don't go unpacking it all and then assessing what was said because then you're assessing it consciously and critically and that's not the point you know, right. and you're, you're kind of almost undoing some of the work by assessing it through that lens instead of just letting the subconscious deal with it behind the curtain, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And, and so do people, do people get emotional during the hypnotherapy, like when they're in that theta state, like the, do emotions come up and, or, mm. you know, how does that work? Yeah. Yeah, they do. And not every time. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's again, everybody responds differently to it. But yes, they can get emotional in that state. Um, and at that point, it, it's just my my job to be there for them, to just you know comfort them where necessary with with my words and and just remind them that they're safe. You know, they're they're yeah. in a safe place, a safe space. And I could also use some techniques where I would encourage them to visualize being say in a safety bubble or something like that. Not if they had claustrophobia, of course, but, mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, something to encourage them that they're in a safe space and time in that place. And they can just experience whatever emotions they're feeling freely and just feel those feelings until they no longer need to be felt. And then we can move on with the session. Right. Because a lot of the times, you know, we don't like to feel our emotions, myself included, and have a habit sure. of suppressing them and or distracting or, you know, getting away. And I mean, they don't really disappear. Unfortunately, they just sit there and wait to come back at a more yep. opportune time. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, 100 percent, right, to work through them and allow them to fully express. And that's how you kind of get through them. And that's sort of true in general, like. Yeah. Hypnotherapy is one way you can do it, but there's mm -hmm. uh, lots of ways in general. But so, mm. 
Okay, so I, I got two questions here. So my one question is, in terms of the visualization side of it, right? You just mentioned that um, you sometimes help people like visualize a safety bubble or whatever it is. And, you know, we spoke earlier about your visualization techniques in your martial arts competi competitions. Um, so how does that work? Like, where does, how does that come into play? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, the mind sees in pictures and feels feelings. And yeah. so also whatever we see in here, that is that is our perception of it you know what's going on out there in the in the real world we only perceive it through our own lens that we're looking upon it and interacting with the world and so things could be you know what what one person might refer to as just a normal day if someone's got clinical depression for example and they're seeing the world through that lens they could experience the same stuff that that other person experiences as normal and just just a day-to-day -day thing and and it could be like the end of the world to them and so mm -hmm. whatever whatever our perception is in here that's that will manifest our reality to use your words from earlier and the brain cannot tell the difference between what's going on in here and what is going on out yeah. there and so if we can harness that and visualize a positive outcome of what we want the brain with repetition and with feeling and with making that visualization as vivid and real as possible the brain will think that it's already happening and just accept mm -hmm. it as fact and then make it more likely that you're going to view the world in a more positive way you're more likely to do the things that you need to do to create and manifest that visualization that you've just been practicing because your brain will look for ways to make it come to pass. It, it's, it's such a powerful thing. And so by look, by creating that image in the mind, it can be a still image. It can be a movie, depending on whatever it is that you're wanting to do or wanting to achieve. Mm -hmm. By making that image as real as possible, you know, filling your full field of view, bearing in mind you've probably got your eyes closed at this point, but just whatever we can see in our field of view now, filling that up with that image, making all the colors high definition, you know, crystal clear resolution, sharp as, you know, as, yeah. as can possibly be, as if we're really there right now. And then using our other senses in that as well, you know, hearing the sounds that we might hear, the sensations of touch and temperature, things like that, making it as vivid and real as possible. We're kind of tricking the brain into thinking that that's really happening in that moment. And right. that's, that's how, the, how visualization can be so powerful. I, I remember on the... The hypnotherapy course that I studied um, just after I did the NLP qualification, my mentor at the time, uh, Carl, who, who passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, but I remember him talking about Carl Lewis, the former, you know, Team USA sprinter in like the late 80s and early 90s. And he was talking about some study that was conducted at, at a US university. I forget which university it was, but they hooked Carl Lewis's legs up to an EMG machine, an electromyograph machine. So they put little electrodes on his quadriceps, on his hamstrings, his glutes, his calves, and he would be sitting in a chair and they'd have him close his eyes and visualize running a hundred meter race you know, the Olympics, the world championships, whatever it was from start to finish. So getting into the blocks, settling down, you know, hearing the, the mark for set and then hearing the gun and then actually running the race and going across the line. And the EMG machine measured every single muscle in his legs firing as, the, as they hmm. would, not as powerfully, but as they right. would 
if he were physically running that race there and he was just sitting down, just using his mind and visualizing it. And that's, that's a perfect example of the power of visualization manifesting in a physical sort of um, experience right here, right now. Yeah. That's crazy that that happened. Mm. I mean, that they can do that, right? Um, mm. And that, I mean, it's great. Not, not crazy in a bad way. Yeah, yeah, like, I, I know um, what you yeah, meant. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that's so cool because it means that you can train yourself to do or be, you know, I mean, various versions better of whatever it is. I mean, you know, perhaps you can't visualize it. Like, it, listen, I mean, there's limits, right? Like, I can't visualize myself to beat Usain Bolt in a running race. Like, that's just not going to happen as much as I try and train. Like, I, whatever. <laughs> like, I'm not built for yeah. that. But I could certainly do it for um, what I know I could possibly achieve, right? Mm. And so whatever I think that I'm just to use me as an example, whatever I think I want to have or be or do or achieve, right? To think that I, I, I can start like training my brain essentially to know what that's like in order to get myself in a better position and be more ready for it as it sort of manifests. I mean, that, that's pretty crazy. Uh, mm. Like it, it's awesome. But so how does it work when, um, how does it work when you like know that it's how do you get past the hurdle of knowing that it's not actually happening you know can, can you elaborate a little bit more sure so it's like cuz i've tried um various like visualization stuff before right cuz um yeah whatever but i mean I, I always get sort of tripped up at the place where i'm like I'm trying to like put myself in this situation, right? That I want to ha have or be or do and really feel what it's like. But there's always a part of me that's going like, yeah, but it's not real. Right. Where it's like, it's, you're just, you're just making it up or like, this isn't going to work. Or I guess it's a whole lot of like doubts that start to come up. Right. Um, so yeah. is, is the process of dealing with that to just allow the doubts to be there and just continue on anyway? Um, or is, is there a way to like, uh, counteract the doubt or, you know, how, what do you sort of suggest in that capacity? Sure. It depends on the individual again. And, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll preface that with not every technique will work equally well for every individual. You know, some people are more visually stimulated. So mm. visualization might be a really good tool for them. Other people might be more auditory in their in their kind of learning style or their their interface with the world, and they might not right. have as much in the way of visual stuff, but they might be have, have a real keen ear for sounds and use a lot of um, words that correlate to the auditory system. Other people might be kinesthetic in terms of hmm. touch and feel of things and, and physical movements. And that might really resonate with them. And so having a technique that suits your, I suppose, I'll say learning style. It's not just learning, but your, your, the way you best interact, that's yeah. something to consider with that. Hmm. But then going on to, on to the, the, the doubts and, and stuff like that, we all have, a negativity bias hardwired into us biologically. It's, mm -hmm. it's a self-preservation technique from, you know, way back, you know, thousands of years ago with the cavemen and stuff where if they, you know, left the cave to go and get food, they had to be very aware of danger. There might be a saber toothed tiger around the corner waiting to, yeah. you know, for lunch essentially. And so we are hardwired to look out for danger or what we perceive as danger. You know, now in, in the, the developed world, we don't have any of that. And so that's where things like anxiety can creep in from because the brain's looking for something to protect us from. It's looking on the alert for that danger. And so it might be the boss who's an idiot or, you know, or you name COVID or, you know, we'll not go yeah. down that rabbit hole, but you know what I mean? So, it's 
it's looking for some danger to protect you from because the brain doesn't care about you being happy. The mind doesn't care about yeah. you being happy. It wants to survive and replicate. That's it. And so anything that can be perceived as a threat, it's going to put up those doubts. It's going to fire those, they call them ants, N-A-N-T-S, automatic negative thoughts. Mm. And it takes practice to overcome that. And if, if your visualization is something, let's say, a bit more grandiose, or it might be the the final outcome that you're wanting to achieve, whatever that is, if it's that gold medal or that first place trophy, but you're not there yet, those doubts might just keep coming in at you. Well, that's not real. You're not good enough yet. You're not there, et cetera, et cetera. And so in which case then we need, need to change the visualization to maybe a process right. goal instead of an outcome goal. So maybe it's just imagining performing to your best and how would that feel regardless of the outcome. It might be changing the words that you're saying to yourself in that instance, you know, reframe those automatic negative thoughts, write them down on a piece of paper and reframe them. So it, it might be, oh, you're not good enough. So change it to you're not good enough yet. Or, mm. you know, little things, little techniques like that. And it depends on the individual, as I keep saying, as to what will resonate best. But it's practice. We've practiced having these doubts. And so yeah. many of those 70 to 90,000 thoughts we have a day are the same stuff. And if it's the same crap that you're telling yourself every day, you're going to get really good at feeling crap, you know. And so with practice if we can reframe those and just try and implant some more positive thoughts and positive visualizations that might be just a little bit further along than we are now with mm -hmm. repetition and consistency, those will overtake because as I said before, the brain it's looking for that balance and that homeostasis and anything that we're not thinking anymore, it would be like it, it literally will prune that neural pathway because it's not needed. It will clear it out of there because it's an old right. unwanted thought. Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I really like what you said about, I mean, I, I think the crucial bit is, is that it does depend on you as a person, right? Where it's like yeah. what works for you and what doesn't. I mean, humans, although we're, you know, remarkably similar, we're also infinitely varied in our yeah. um, expression of life. And so, you know, to read something and be like, well, this will work for everyone or whatever. It's like, well, maybe, uh, probably not, but you know, it might work for you. So give it a try. Um, yeah. and I mean, it's the same thing in everything, right? Like people respond to different types of exercise routines, right? Yeah, and they like absolutely. different types of exercise. And that, I mean, I mean, I guess you could quantify which one's better or worse in general, but it's not particularly helpful. You, it's more helpful to be like, what's going to work the best for you? And you might have to try out a bunch of things to know that because you might not just know because maybe you've never done any of it before. And then how could you possibly know which one's going to be better for you? Right. And yeah. so with, I guess with the visualization stuff, it's like, well, you know, just to use me as the example again, it's like, I guess I've tried some stuff and maybe that stuff didn't click so well for me. But maybe there's a bunch of other things that I have yet to try, which might work. And I just sort of need to be open and allow myself to even try it and not be like, oh, well, I tried it once or twice and it didn't work. So I'm giving up. It's like, yeah, well, I mean, what's, yeah, that's not going to work, right? That's not a good recipe for success mm -hmm. in life. <laughs> you know, yeah, you fail that, a couple of times and you give up. It's like, mm. Yeah, that's not, yeah, that's not going to, you're not going to go very far, but it's I, also, it's interesting what you said about how, you know, most of our thoughts and processes that are unconscious, um, it's all about maintaining that homeostasis. And so change is actually can be very difficult because you're changing something you're, you're, and it's this weird battle between yourself of like, you know, that you should be doing differently and yet something in you is trying to prevent you from even doing that, right? And so, mm -hmm. and I think that this is something everyone experiences to a greater or lesser degree. And I guess it depends on also how people deal with change in general determines how they approach change 
in the future, you know, like some people are like so resistant to any change that, you know, it's just like almost out of the question unless they're forced into it, which, you know, sucks for them because it's just suffering. Um, and then you get some people who thrive on the process of change and they know it sucks, but they like that part of it because of, or they like the outcome at least. And so they know that they can and will get through the difficult part to reach the end goal, right? And with yep. practice, that's kind of where you can be because you get to learn about yourself and how you deal with the struggles of change and where you run into obstacles internally or externally and how to deal with them. And so, you know, I, I guess for me, it's about like just consistency and doing it with, you know, compassion for yourself and not being hypercritical and falling back into those old habits and knowing that, you know, a lot of the negative shit will come up and expect it to come up and not be mad when it does come up, <laughs> you know, because yeah. that will just, That's that ruins right. it for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just have one quick, uh, a another question. It's a little bit off topic, but you know, yeah. have you ever heard of, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of it, you know, binaural beats, right? Yes. Which is this sort of like trendish thing in music or music esque areas where people that the claim is that you can impact your brain waves or you can change them to like alpha, beta, theta, delta, you listening to music that is at that frequency or at different frequencies to create that frequency. Like, do you have yes. experience with that at all? Yeah, I've, I've done some hypnotherapy recordings in the past using binaural beats music. Mm. And so, yes, they would be best nice. listened to with headphones, you know, and, and as, as you so rightly say there, the, the beats will have a certain frequency going in this ear and then a different frequency going in this ear. And then when they, they cancel each other out and the residual that's left is that resultant frequency that's then in theory supposed to entrain your brain waves into that mm. alpha, theta, or even delta state. And so, yeah, I, I've used them in the past um, for my recordings. I don't tend to use them in, in a session mainly because I, I don't have my client wearing headphones. Um, I just speak to them, you know, like this, although you can do that. I mean, again, Carl, my mentor, that's how he used to conduct his hypnotherapy sessions. He would have the client hmm. with headphones on and he would speak into a microphone so he could play music in the background and they would be fed that music straight into the ears. So it, it it's certainly a way of doing it. It's not something that I've done very much, but yeah, I, I have used and, and I do have a few of the binaural beats oh, cool. uh, tracks to play with. Awesome. And it does work, I guess. That, that My question, I suppose, if I had to you know, delve it down would be like, does this shit work? Like, is it real or is it uh, just uh, a bit of placebo? But I suppose even if it were placebo, it would still work. Um, exactly. You know, <laughs> who's, who, I think, who is it? Joe Dispenza has got the book, You Are the Placebo, you know? Yep. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, listen, brother, this has been a, a fantastic conversation and I thank you very much for coming on today. Um, which, is there anything you'd like to promote? Like how can people contact you if they're interested in training or in, in hypnotherapy? Like where can we find you? Sure thing. Well, what I'll say, Shane, is that um, the last year through COVID has, has forced us all to adapt. You know, and before the last year, I had never done any hypnotherapy virtually. It had always mm. been in-person either with on an individual basis with a client or with a group, and I would always be there physically. Yeah. The last year I started working virtually when we were, you know, in lockdown and things. And I was always a little bit skeptical as to how well it would work. Um, but it worked surprisingly well. As long as we both have a decent internet connection and there's that rapport and trust there, there's no reason why it can't work just as well as if I was physically there. And so that opened mm -hmm. my eyes a little bit and expanded my business in terms of who I could promote to. And so literally now I could work with, with anybody around the world, you know? And so I'm, I'm reaching out to more 
people further afield, more athletes to work with, to help them with their sports performance using NLP and hypnotherapy and sports psychology and just doing virtual sessions with them now. And so that's the, the main thing that I would, I would like to promote really essentially just to, uh, to say, even if you're, you know, you're in Canada or you're in South Africa or wherever yeah. you are in the world, you know, if, if there's something that you want to achieve that, that I could possibly help with, we can do that. You know, I, we don't have to be physically in the same location now. And so for, for that, I would just say my, my email address is the best place to contact me directly. And, and that is Stuart at don't hyphen lose hyphen weight dot co dot UK. I have an online um, business as well for, which is weight loss. And that, that is, www.don't-lose-weight.co.uk. And that's a program of hypnotherapy recordings, diet plans, and training uh, protocols where we're, we're addressing all three things, essentially, the mind and the body and the diet. And hmm. uh, But the email address is, is the best place to reach me if any of your listeners are, are curious or want to learn a little bit more about hypnotherapy. And I do a free consultation via Zoom for anybody, regardless of if they want to go ahead with with a course of sessions or not. I'm I'm open to talking about about it with anybody. Amazing, and I'll include those links in the description for people interested as well. But thanks for for all awesome. of that. And Thank you. Yeah, I mean it's 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 great that you can do it for anyone anywhere in the world. You know what a world we live in. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. yeah. Tell me about it. I hope. Thanks, thanks again, and, and we'll speak soon. Hopefully you'll come on again and we'll, we'll chat some more. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Thank you for having me.